Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. My name is Ann Rudden, and I am here to introduce Adam Lashinsky, who is joining us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Adam is here today to discuss his book, Inside Apple, How America's Most Admired and Secretive Company Really Works. Apple has created some deeply loved products, but even sophisticated business people don't understand how Apple does what it does. Adam will tell us more about some of their unique approaches to, to business. Adam Lashinsky is a senior editor at large for Fortune Magazine, where he covers technology and finance. He is also a frequent speaker and Fox News contributor. Prior to joining Fortune, Lashinsky was a columnist for TheStreet.com and the San Jose Mercury News. Please join me in welcoming Adam Lashinsky. Thank you very much. <clears throat> It's really wonderful to be here. I want to tell you straight off the bat that I'm uh, doing this presentation on PowerPoint and running off a PC. <laughs> a dirty little secret that I've been waiting to reveal until I uh, got here is that I wrote the book on a PC <laughs> in Word. So thank you. Thank you very much. I have to uh, get some things off my screen. There we go. Um, and one other sort of uh, opening, opening comment is that I, uh, I know that a lot of people, when they begin a talk, ask people to turn off their telephones or to, or to close their laptops. Um, I would like you to do just the opposite. I'm assuming that if you, if you are looking at your phone or your laptop that you're either tweeting or on Facebook. I'm at Adam Lashinsky on Twitter and uh, Adam Lashinsky also on Facebook. And you're more than welcome to comment on, on, on what I'm saying. So, and one last very important caveat. Uh, I, spent the, I have spent more than the last year researching Apple. And there are, in fact, in my book, some, some comments comparing Apple and Microsoft from people who, who are in a position to make comparisons. But I, however, have not been studying Microsoft for the last year. So I'm more than willing to have a conversation in the Q&A with you about comparisons between the two companies. And, and uh, I'll, I'll be delighted if you draw your own conclusions uh, in terms of compare and contrast from the things that I, um, that I said, but it's not my goal here to, to, to necessarily do that compare and contrast for you, but th th there'll be, there will be elements, including in some of the, in some of the images that I show, that, uh, that will reflect on these comparisons. So uh, I'll, I'll leave some time so that we can get into it together um, when I'm done. My, uh, my overarching thesis of the book is, uh, is that Apple behaves differently in almost every way from other businesses and, in fact, uh, <clears throat> disregards much of what is taught in business school. And Steve Jobs had a, um, a low opinion of MBA programs and of the curriculum in, in, uh, in business schools, which is one of the reasons why, toward the end of his life, he created Apple University, which he thought of as being uh, an Apple MBA. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll get into some of the specifics. The highest level difference between the Apple way and what I characterize as the other way, uh, and the one that, that still strikes me as the biggest realization is Apple's aversion to the notion of general management. Apple doesn't like the concept of a general manager. Jobs saw no reason why he, he should have jacks of all trades working in the company. He valued people for their expertise, and he, saw, he also thought that it would be a mistake to take somebody who's doing a really good job for the company, for the shareholders, an expert on their, uh, on their, their domain, and move them around to broaden them. It's, it's, we all understand why it's good for that person to broaden them, but it's a little bit less clear why it might be so good for the shareholders or for the product to move these people around. And it's a theme that I want you to think about because I'll, I'll come back to it in other ways. Um, a moment on before Steve Jobs came back to Apple in, in 1997. Uh, th this company was a fallen idol, and one of the things that 
uh, occurred to me as I was thinking back to 1997, because that was the year that I moved to Silicon Valley and joined the San Jose Mercury News, is just how relatively irrelevant Apple was at the time. And to set the scene for you, I, I was, having joined the San Jose Mercury News, right around the time of Gil Emilio's firing and the Microsoft $150 million investment in Apple, I was sort of taken aback by the hometown boosterism for Apple in the newsroom at the Mercury News. The Mercury News, in my opinion, had bought into this notion that Apple's our team and Microsoft was the, uh, the opposing team and was the bad guy. And I said, you know, look, th uh, that's all very interesting, but we're business journalists and it seems preposterous to me that we would ignore the most important company, not ignore, but that we would have a sort of an emotional opinion about the most important company in the industry at the expense of the hometown company, which really isn't that important anymore. Um, that was not a popular opinion for, for me to take. But when Jobs came back, it's now been repeated many times, the company was 90 days uh, f from insolvency. Uh, its supply chain was a shambles. It owned far too much inventory and had factories all over the place, including in the United States. And uh, uh, it behaved, there were multiple fiefdoms and multiple products within Apple in 1997 when Jobs returned. And the example that I used to illustrate this is that there were, uh, Jobs confronted 16 advertising budgets when he returned to the company. And one of the first things that he did, along with slashing the factories and slashing the product lineup, killing printers, killing uh, the Newton famously, was also uh, eliminating those 16 advertising budgets. And he said, no longer are there going to be 16 budgets, there's gonna be one. And if you think your product deserves advertising support, then you come to me and, and make your case and I'll decide if you're gonna get advertising support. And the result was an increase in advertising spending over time. This was not about cost cutting. It was about controlling the message centrally, which is another theme that's consistent. Uh, I want to talk about leadership. And uh, this is Narcissus, the, uh, the, the god who was in love with, with, in love with himself. And the, uh, in the book, I discuss the business coach and psychotherapist, Michael Maccabee, who wrote a fantastic Harvard Business Review uh, article called, in a book, a, a, a subsequent book called Narcissistic Leaders. And I was, the nar the, a narcissist is someone obviously who is visionary, who doesn't care what anybody else thinks, who's willing to take great risks, uh, who, who does not care if they're loved, but expects to be followed and is charismatic. And m as I, and, and Maccabee a adds on to this the productive narcissist. He in his, in his practice would coach business executives whom he diagnosed clinically as being narcissistic to channel their narcissism in a productive way so that they could screen out some of the bad tendencies of a narcissist and, fo and, and focus them uh, to productive gain for the company. And as I was reading this article, for the first few pages I thought, he's writing about Steve Jobs and he hasn't mentioned Steve Jobs' name yet. And then he does mention Steve Jobs and he uses them as an example. This is not a derogation, by the way, to refer to him as a productive narcissist. Maccabee sees it as, a, as an accurate, psychological, Jungian description. By the way, the two other categories that Maccabee talks about, and these will be people that you will recognize in the room, and, and we all have um, elements of, of all of these characteristics, although Jobs probably didn't have uh, the third one. The second is a productive obsessive. The narcissist needs, a, needs an obsessive as a sidekick to get things done because the narcissist is not interested in details, uh, at least not boring details, maybe important details, but not the mundane stuff of, of business. The third category is what uh, Maccabee calls erotics. Erotics are people who do need to be loved, who are very good team members. They want to work to help the team succeed. They are very hurt if somebody criticizes them or if they are not being valued or respected. These are not people who typically will be leaders, but that doesn't mean that they can't be very good um, team members. And my, my point is the sort of unusual observation or, or to put a I don't know, an academic patent on this, on this observation of how Apple had, had been run for the past 15 years by this prototypical productive narcissist. Um, one of the central tenets of 
business, I think, in, in our modern day is that uh, man, good managers push decision making down into the organization. They empower their people to make decisions and to get things done. That is not the Apple way. Uh, Jobs was a famous micromanager and the people beneath him micromanaged as much as he did. In my book I describe the interchange that he had with the person whose job it was to write uh, an, a product uh, news release email that would go out simultaneously with the big keynote at the Moscone Center. And this person went back and forth with Jobs over and over regarding the punctuation in the email, the comma or the semicolon. You know, I tell this story and some business audiences are not surprised by this at all. I say, yeah, my CEO would do that. I find it surprising that he would chew up the kind of time it would take to, uh, to go over grammar in, in an email. Uh, a hallmark of, of Apple's business culture is its secrecy. Uh, this, was, this is a, a chapter in my book and it was an excerpt in Fortune magazine and it's been, I think it's come to define what my book is about. It's not the only thing my book is about their culture, but their culture is one of secrecy. And secrecy is multifaceted at Apple. And my line is that all companies keep secrets. At Apple, everything, but everything is a secret. Uh, they have a sense of humor about this. This is a t-shirt that you can actually buy at the company store in Cupertino that's open to the public. I visited the Apple campus, but that's all I'm allowed to say. I just love this t-shirt. I, I bought it for my editor at the height of our, of our stress of getting, getting the book done and sent it to him. Uh, uh, this is, uh, Apple's very aware of it. Its culture of secrecy is, is unique and a little bit extreme. Um, the, but, but here's how the secrecy works. It works, with a, it works with threats. And the hallmark of the new employee orientation on your first day at, at Apple, and it happens uh, every Monday, uh, is the security briefing. Now, the security briefing, a security official explains to the new recruits why secrecy is so important. That secrecy, keeping our product secret, for example, is worth uh, untold hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to the company. And if you divulge our secrets, um, there, you, you'll be punished, you'll be fired, and maybe sued, by the way. And this is on your first day of work at Apple. So why, why keep secrets? The, the obvious reason is, to, um, is so that the public will be delighted when they receive the beautiful products that you're going to sell them. And I think this is an important topic in the technology industry because Apple, has, Apple really goes against the grain of how the tech industry works. Most of the industry um, signals what its products are going to be for quite some time. And we all know there's good reasons for signaling what your products are going to be, you want to, uh, in particular because you want to give developers the, the time and the opportunity and the nurturing that they need to have their products ready for your products. Apple does this, of course, but they do it, they do it in extreme secrecy so that uh, word won't get out to the public. There's a, like a business 101 reason for doing this as well. We all know it. You, uh, you have a product on the shelves, and even more importantly, in warehouses, and you let the public know that a new version is coming very soon, guess what? You just killed the value of the product on the shelves and the value even more so of the warehouses. Those are never going to get out of the warehouse, at least not at a profitable price point. Um, multiple Silicon Valley companies have, have screwed this up over the years, and this is something that Apple rare, rarely, not never, but rarely screws up. Um, the, uh, they, they take secrecy to an extreme. I, I really enjoy the anecdote in my book of someone I know who plays in a regular poker game with Apple uh, employees. This person does not work at Apple. And, uh, you know, my opinion from my time in the Valley, and I, I, I would think it's consistent with the engineering culture in Redmond, is that engineers like to talk about their work. Journalists certainly like to talk with other journalists about their work. No one goes out of their way. You don't, you don't reveal what you're working on in any great detail, but you do like to talk about the technical aspects, uh, you know, what languages are interesting to you. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I shouldn't veer into assuming what engineers talk about, but I think you get my point. Apple people don't. And the anecdote from the, from the poker table is that when the subject of, po of uh, Apple comes up at the poker table, the subject is changed. Now, the... My realization working on, this, working on this book 
was every company tries to keep its secrets from the outside world. They keep secrets from journalists where appropriate. The difference at Apple is how Apple keeps secrets from its own people. In an age when transparency is the norm, when at Google, for example, one of the justifications, I don't know if they still use this, but in the early days, the justification for all the free food was the hope that people would meet in the cafeteria and they would talk about what was going on and what they were working on, and, and they would meet people from other parts of the company and share ideas. Apple people don't do this. They're discouraged from doing it. And I like an Apple employees to um, horses fitted with blinders. You do not look left, you do not look right, you focus on what you're doing. And um, m what you're working on is none of my business and what I'm working on is none of your business. Now this sounds harsh, and uh, perhaps it is, but one of the, uh, over and over I would hear people say with a straight face, that below a certain level, Apple is not a particularly political organization. And I came to understand why. If you don't have any information, you can't play politics. <laughs> and so this is one more way that the company focuses because, again, I'm making a generalization, but people focus on their job. They come in. They don't multitask, by the way. Uh, because they're not asked to do 17 things, they're asked typically to do one thing. And, um, and that, by the way, extends to how they learn about things. When, um, to this day, even in the age of streaming video, when Apple, when, when Apple senior management does a public keynote for the likes of me, and uh, um, the Apple employees will gather in the cafeterias in Cupertino, and they'll watch on closed circuit television to see what's being announced. This is the first time they're going to see the product also. And that includes the people who worked on the product because they'll only be familiar with the feature that they worked on. And uh, there will be this, you know, this sense of pride, this sense of accomplishment, and then they get back to work. Not a culture of, of back padding or celebrating achievements. Um, Apple has a culture and a language around the notion of disclosure, and that's the word that they use. The question will be, are you disclosed on this topic? If you're not disclosed on this topic, you don't belong in the meeting, I can't talk to you about it. And uh, people have described to me this kabuki, this awkward dance of trying to figure out, how do I broach the subject of whether or not you're disclosed if I can't really mention the subject that, is, that, that, we're, that we're talking about? Um, they will go so far as to have, you know, badges, badges are not uh, one size fits all at Apple. Badges only get you into where you have authorization to get. I've been told more than once by people that they could go certain places that their superiors couldn't go <coughs> because they were allowed to go to this room and, and others weren't. And uh, Apple is, is famous for building special rooms where once there were clear glasses, now there's frosted glass. Once there were no walls, now there's walls. The carpenters have come in and built walls put in new security badge system, and then only the people who are working on this project are allowed into that lockdown room. And uh, as, as I describe it, if, uh, if you don't know what's going on in that room, that's because you're not working on that project, and uh, you know enough if you've been there for a while not to ask. Uh, you would have been told if you, if you were supposed to have been told. Uh, don't try to read the writing. It it's actually is highly accurate, but it's, but it's hard to read from a distance. This is Apple's org chart, and uh, I created this org chart in Fortune Mag, a, very, a variation of this org chart in Fortune Magazine in May of last year. Steve Jobs was the sun king in the center of this when, when we published the magazine article, and I, I, I've come to think it's a little less dramatic with Tim Cook in the center, but the point is to show the, and then by the way, what I love as a journalist is that org charts are a very controversial topic at Apple. Apple doesn't do org charts. They don't print org charts. People were, I was told, were nervous to have my org chart on their desk at Apple. And this goes back to the secrecy and almost this paranoia of people understanding on the outside what goes, in on the, what goes on on the inside. Um, and I think what's startling about the org chart is that the CEO really is no more than two levels removed from all the important vice presidents in the company. 
uh, and they only have about 70 vice presidents out of like for 26,000, 27,000 non-retail employees. Jobs, of course, was famous for reaching down wherever he felt like it and far below the vice president level as well for getting information from Apple employees. Uh, I don't know and I don't think we really know yet it, how Tim Cook will compare in, in that regard. Uh, I think it's well known by now that Apple sweats the details. It's a detail-oriented company. They have enough managers who are productive obsessives uh, running product. The details are important across the company. And what I've found is it's an amazingly consistent company. So anytime I'm talking about design, I might as well be talking about marketing or, uh, or human resources or any of the other functions. And the detail that I write about in the book has to do with a packaging room, uh, the packaging design room where I, I describe a packaging designer whose job it was to figure out exactly where to put that little piece of cellophane tape on the iPod box that we peel off when we open the box. And there were some 150 prototype boxes in the room and this person spent a matter of weeks practicing taking the, taking the tape off. The sticker, I guess, would be a better, a clear sticker would be a better way of putting it. Um, seems odd, but uh, I tend to get a lot of head nodding when I ask, has anybody ever, and I, this is a, a contentious thing to say here, but does anybody remember the time they first opened an iPod box or an iPhone box and it came off perfectly and the phone came up and you took it out and everything was very neatly put together and you get a sense for their attention to detail. Um, Jobs was quoted many times saying that, uh, explaining why Apple doesn't do traditional market research or customer research or focus groups. Uh, his attitude was, why would we ask people about products that they don't know that they want? That's our job is to de design those products and give them what they want. I just like this image of the uh, faithful standing in line in the rain outside the 24 by 7 Fifth Avenue Apple store in New York City. Uh, it's well known by now, I think, that one of the, the hallmarks of Apple's success is its tight integration. Jobs spoke at length in his later years about the importance of integrating hardware and software. But it's not just hardware and software, it's all the other functions of the company. And this part's important with design being preeminent. And I, obviously design is important for every manufacturer of everything. It's my sense, and I may have, I, I may have drunk the Kool-Aid on this too much, but it's my sense that it's unusual the way that the, the, the seat at the table that design has at Apple, that they're willing to sacrifice other things for design, that it's unfathomable for a financial person to tell Jonathan I, the head of design at Apple, how something should go. <laughs> we can't afford that. Or a material science person to say, that can't be built. And his attitude with Jobs' support, obviously, has been, no, this is what it's going to look like. Now you go figure out how to build it, and you go figure out how, how we're going to pay for it. Um, it's truly unique. One of the, um, please brace yourself, one of the hallmarks of, um, of Apple's approach, oh, I just realized it says Apple's says no more than yes, so I, 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 need, to, I need to fix that. Um, is the power of saying no. Jobs would say that it's is as important or far more important to say no than it is to say yes. And the, the saying no at Apple, again, is multifaceted. Apple says no to new products. It says no to features on its products. It says no to industries that it will go into. It has famously said no for years now to targeting the enterprise. And we know how that's going for them for right now, showing no love but getting a lot of traction because people who work at companies in the enterprise happen to be consumers who buy Apple products. And um, this comes under the rubric, I think, of, of, of discipline. It's, it's been an incredibly disciplined company, and I think it is hard to say no. It's hard for all of us to say no. We want to do the next thing. And um, 
And I think it's well, well illustrated by, and again, with apologies, this graphical representation of you know, what you get in the box when you buy a, a PC from a retailer versus um, taking your iMac out of the box. Uh, Apple says no in ways that are, that are interesting to me as a journalist as well. We'll never know, I don't think, why exactly they pulled out of Macworld, but I think that their explanation was at least one version of the truth. If you remember, I can't remember the year, I want to say 2009, uh, Apple decide, uh, announced that, that Macworld would be its last, and it was right around the time of, of, of a Steve Jobs' uh, medical leave. And so there was speculation, well, they're, he, they're not, we're not going to do Macworld anymore because Steve can't do Macworld. I buy, at a certain level, their public explanation, which was no, we just don't see the value of putting all this energy into somebody else's event anymore when we, can, when we do our own events and we have our own dialogue with our customers in the retail stores every single day around the world. And so they basically, you know, flipped the bird to Macworld and stopped going, this event that had been their primary promotional vehicle for so long. And uh, having just been in Davos a couple weeks ago, I'm just personally amused at the notion of a Microsoft executive, uh, sorry, excuse me, an Apple executive, any Apple executive, uh, sitting in a chair on stage at the World Economic Forum in Davos. They just, they're just not there. It's just completely outside of their cultural makeup to be in, to be in Davos. And I'll, I'll, I'll eat my words on this when an Apple executive shows up in Davos, but I'm not too concerned about that happening anytime soon. Um, some, uh, some aspects of the Apple uh, work culture. I wrote in my May article about the DRI. It's been around at Apple for a long time. It actually precedes Jobs. Uh, return to the company. The DRI stands for the Directly Responsible Individual. You go to a meeting, there's a list of tasks. Next to each task is a name. That name is the DRI. It's so simple. And yet, mo mo all of us know companies that don't do it well. And um, I, I personally began last year to make myself a little bit obnoxious around my magazine when I would ask people, uh, so who's the DRI on that? And they'd say, yeah, all right, shut up. Um, <laughs> But, hokey or not, it speaks to a culture of accountability and responsibility. This is the person who's going to be on the hook if it doesn't go right. That person's the DRI. Um, I mentioned Apple's aversion to um, general management. And the flip side of that is that it's a massively functional place. Uh, and, and I spoke about that already. People are... They go very deep and they have responsibility across the corporation for what they do. The example I gave is in the book is that um, the, the, the Apple's graphic arts department chooses photographic images for, for everything, for the website, for marketing collateral, for the uh, uh, Apple stores. Any other company would have individual people in, their, in these units responsible for graphical images, and that's not their way. There's many more examples like that, mostly including the fact that and this is truly radical, I think, that the, the lack of individual P&Ls for parts of the Apple business. It's one company with one P&L. The CFO owns it. It takes a lot of the burden about thinking about money away from managers in other parts of the company. Their job is to make product or market product or procure product, not to, um, not to worry about profits. Not to say they don't worry, but anyway, I think you get the point. Um, in selected ways, Apple's been very good at behaving like a startup. Uh, it is not a startup, make no mistake, and I'm, and I'm not trying to suggest that it is, but it's been, it's been very good at uh, taking small groups and having them work on important projects and trying to emulate the best of a startup. And so I liken them to, uh, these, are, uh, these are rich kids doing a startup because they're in a small group, they're hived off separately, but they've got some very good resources from daddy. Uh, they've, got, they've got Apple's balance sheet to, to do this startup. Small numbers are an important part of the company. And uh, I wrote in May about the top 100, which is this highly secretive, highly selective group that Jobs would put together approximately once a year when he was healthy. Take these top people, not by rank, by the way, 
necessarily by rank, but by who he thought were the hundred or so most important people at the company. And he would do, a, do an offsite someplace in Santa Cruz or, or Carmel, the Monterey Bay area. And uh, just very Apple-like, he insisted that uh, people attending a top 100 go there on a bus that would leave the Cupertino campus and drive down. He didn't want anybody driving themselves. I, I, I have this image of these executives who over the years are worth tens or maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars getting on the coach bus to go, to go down to Santa Cruz for a meeting. He uh, didn't want people putting it on their calendar. He didn't want people doing work while they were there. He would have the room swept of bugs to make sure that you all weren't monitoring what was going on at a, at a top 100. Uh, but the point is that <clears throat> secrets were so tightly held <clears throat> among a, a much smaller group that he wanted these people who were leaders in the company on a fairly regular basis to understand the roadmap of where things were going, but <clears throat> not to be confused with doing this at an all-hands meeting. That, that's not where these types of things were going to be discussed. Um, Apple's a very good marketer, obviously, and uh, one of the hallmarks of their marketing is staying on script. And I have a lot about this in, in the book. Y you know, I think hundred, a thousand songs in your pocket is, is, is an example of, of sheer genius. They were describing a product that already existed on the market. Um, there were probably MP3 players that could give you a thousand songs at the time. Uh, but they came up with the idea of a thousand songs in your pocket and repeated it over and over and over until we started repeating it. M one of my favorite anecdotes in the book is about the launch of the iPhone, and I quote one of the executives who, uh, who was one of the very few people who was authorized to speak about the iPhone publicly. And his point to me was, here's how you control the message. You work on the script <clears throat> of what the marketing message is going to be. Then you're going to go do media interviews. And you do many, many media interviews. And promoting a book, I understand now what, he, what he's talking about, of doing many, many interviews. And he said, intellectually, you're going to want to deviate from the script because you're just going to want to amuse yourself or entertain yourself. But your listener's hearing it for the first time, so you need to deliver it the, the way you were taught. And the reason you, want, you do that is that you want the listener to repeat the script to whoever they're going to talk to, to their friends so that now the message starts coming back into the public realm of exactly what the script was that we've already agreed on to sell the product. Um, a hallmark of, of Apple marketing for years, even before the company was blessed with $100 billion in cash the way it is today, was that Apple will spend, um, will spend anything to market, and to, obviously to make, but to market its products. And the story I just love is of the launch of iMovie HD in 2005 at Macworld. If you remember, seven years ago, HD was new. There weren't a lot of cameras, there weren't a lot of televisions that played it. But Apple was going to go ahead and release an HD version. It wanted to uh, demonstrate the, the beauty and the value of, of high def. So Jobs said he wanted a wedding. He knew, they knew, by the way, that uh, weddings were a popular use for iMovie, uh, which is, you know, interesting. It's not that they don't pay attention to how customers use the product. That's different from not doing customer research. Um, so they, an Apple employee allowed her wedding to be shot, and they shot a beautiful, elegant wedding at the Officers Club in the Presidio in San Francisco. And they showed the clips to Jobs, and he said in so many words, I don't like it. And it was, it was too elegant, the, it was beautiful, but it was somber. That's not the image we want. He said, I want a beach, maybe Hawaii. I want feet, bare feet in the sand. This was three weeks before Macworld. And so the team found a, 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 an actress or a model, I can't remember which, but a beautiful bride, obviously, very important in Apple marketing. You all know this. Um, unless they're portraying someone not associated with Apple, then, they, <laughs> then they're not beautiful. Um, you know this. Who was having a wedding uh, right before New Year's Eve, and uh, in, in Maui, they sent a crew at tremendous expense. They offered to pay for the flowers and to send a video as, a, as compensation for, you know, interrupting this person's wedding. And uh, they shot the video. They got it back to California. They showed it to Steve. He approved it. 
and they put a 30 second clip in Macworld. Uh, there was some collateral also, I think, in retail stores and maybe in the hallways afterwards. And that's a, that's a still image of, the, of, of what they did. It spent a, they spent a lot of money on it, and they didn't care about the money. Um, I mentioned to you that, that, any, that, that there, it's a consistent company, and on this point of the marketing, the marketing is all about, being, is all about simplicity. And this is a, a wall... This is a, a, a recreation of, of, a, of an actual wall in a marketing building on the, on the Apple campus. As, as the people who work in marketing walk in the building, they have to go around this wall every day to get to their desks. And um, except that's not what the wall actually says. That's what it says. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, imagine having this point um, hammered home to you. Every day you come to work, you begin to, you begin to get the point of why we look at commas and periods and semicolons. Um, Apple, as you know, has a unique way of dealing with people like me. They keep the press at arm's length, with interesting exceptions. They lavish attention on product reviewers. And I know you all, you all do, but uh, they will go to amusing lengths in, uh, I I for product reviewers these two fellows in particular. And uh, I encourage you to read in my book what, uh, how Apple reacted when David Pogue, who's a very friendly fellow, wrote in and said, uh, I, there's something buggy about my Apple TV. They, uh, they got on it really, really quickly, which is different from the reaction that I get if I have a question about, how, about something that I'm doing. Um, they understand, by the way, that celebrity is very important, public image is very important, and I really love the anecdote in my book about when this guy, Harry Connick Jr., uh, sent Steve Jobs an email having to do with need, a problem with his monitor. And uh, Apple has a culture of escalation. Uh, Jobs sent the email to Cook. Cook sent the email to somebody in the supply chain organization who sent the email to uh, one of their employees who got Mr. Connick Jr. a new monitor in 30-some in minutes. Um, one last point before I, before I go to you, and that's on the future of Apple. And uh, I know I've spent, uh, I've spent however many uh, minutes now talking about how wonderful it is. A very important topic going forward is how they're going to face their challenges, not only without Steve Jobs, but just being at the other end of what was one of the most amazing 15-year runs in the history of the corporation. I maintain they could, nev they could never have expected to have another 15 years like the last 15 years, even if Jobs were alive and well. And um, one observation I make, one of these paradoxes of Apple is that it's, a, it's a, an extremely entrepreneurial company. It behaves like an entrepreneurial company. At least that's how it looks from the outside. But guess what? There aren't a lot of entrepreneurs in the company. And there are currently no entrepreneurs on the executive team. Steve Jobs was the entrepreneur at Apple. Tim Cook's an IBMer, for gosh sakes. Uh, that, you know, he bled blue before he, before he went to Apple. Um, Scott Forstall has never worked for a company that Steve Jobs wasn't the CEO of. He, were, he graduated from, from school and went to Next and then went to Apple. Uh, and Jonathan Ive has been, in the rare, the rare interviews that he, goes, that he gives, has been quoted saying that when he had his own design consultancy in London, he didn't particularly care for the business angle of it. And that's the impression that Apple people have about him as well. He's, he's this you know, brilliant designer, but not somebody with a passion for business. And it's Jobs like Bill Gates, was an incredibly shrewd businessman in addition to all of his other uh, qualities. Um, I think I'm right around where I'd like to ask you for your questions. So uh, that's my brand new website and my Twitter handle. And, and I, I thank you for your attention. I'd love to talk about what you want to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Right up front, please. Adam, you gave a very objective uh understanding to us of what Apple is and you know how they've gotten there. What is your subjective opinion of Apple? You know, I, I admire your effort to bait me into, the, into, in, in, into that. I've been, I, this only occurred to me after the article in May when I, maybe someone made this observation to me that the, or, or if I came to it on my own, I can't remember, that my tone in the article and I think my tone in the book is relatively non-judgmental. So I've found that what I write about the workplace, for example, 
is a real Rorschach test for readers because people come to me and they say, what a horrible place to work. And I haven't felt that. I've felt that it's demanding and really tough, maybe not particularly pleasant, but excellent. And so, you know, I've, I've tried not to, I think I've been served well by, uh, by observing, reporting, describing, and analyzing, and that I don't have to, to say whether or not I like it, because I, I don't think it's relevant whether or not I like it. Yeah, please. So Jobs was the ultimate control guy, and uh, he probably kept the company marching in exactly his yeah. direction. To what extent, now that he's gone, do you think the executive team would go in the same direction? or pursue some of their own interests? Well, as individuals, you mean, or take the company well, in you, new directions? You've reported about Forstall, and you know, he, yeah. he's got some ambition there. Do you think, they, yeah. think they'll stay as together as cohesively as when he was there or not? No, I mean, they, like, they can't stay as cohesive as they were. And I, I think this plays into what I said about it would be unrealistic to expect them to, to do as well over the next 15 years as, as they have. Um, you know, there's some weird, uh, weird history if you think about it. So uh, the top team stayed with him for a very long time. And when they left, they tended to be exhausted and rich and they retired. Um, and the few who went out and did something didn't do particularly well at it. So we have shockingly few examples of senior Apple people uh, running things of, of importance. And you'd contrast this with, with ex-Microsoft people and ex-Oracle people, for example, who are, you know, ruling the roost all over the place in the technology industry and beyond. And um, so I think that would have started to have break down a little bit anyway. These are human beings, all of them, as far as I know. <laughs> and uh, so I think they're going to, these are, that's one example of the many challenges that they're going to have. Having said that, two things. One, I, I think he really did imprint a culture of excellence, and, and he stamped the, the culture with his, with his DNA, and they'll continue to do certain things his way, because that's their way. And so, for example, I think design will continue to be preeminent. Now the burden's going to be on having good design, and if they have bad design, they'll fail because of that. But I think they'll fail that way rather than fail by being timid or by all of a sudden letting the accountants call the shots. And, you know, I, I have a quote in the book from Avi Tavanian, a longtime senior software executive, speaking to me before Jobs died. He said, you know, when, uh, after Steve is gone, the competition still won't have Steve Jobs. <laughs> all the way in the back, yeah. It was some news about Microsoft employees gave, up, um, I think, over $100 million to charity this past year. Yeah. But we don't hear anything about Apple. No. I was wondering about the sort of perception of the importance of charity within that company or whether it's just secondary to everything else they do. There, there isn't. So Jobs personally felt that uh, it wasn't the company's job to be philanthropic. He was not philanthropic by all accounts. We, we may find out that that's not true, you know, that he gave some secret money, but there's no evidence of it. And uh, uh, he told senior executives that he, for example, is politically very liberal, and he didn't think it was his place to give the company's money to causes that were of interest to him. He'd rather make money, let the, let the shareholders give away their money. One of the, the, the first public move that, that Tim Cook made as CEO was to institute a philanthropic mat matching grant for U.S. employees, <coughs> ten, up to $10,000, and he noted that this was something that employees wanted. Um, but you've put, your, you know, you've put your finger on it. Jobs was unapologetic about the fact that this was of no interest to him, and he didn't think this was a, a proper corporate function. Furthermore, he, was, he would get very steamed about uh, employees who wanted to have prominent roles in, philanth in philanthropic organizations outside of work. Uh, he wouldn't necessarily stop them, but he definitely didn't want the Apple name to be associated with it. That extended to for-profit things as well. He didn't want people being on boards. Um, unique individual, right? It's not a popular position. Yeah? I know it's hard to make a general statement, but are Apple employees happy? Um, I, I, I reported on this a lot, and so I would, there was a period where I would ask people, is it, is it fun to go to work at Apple? 
and people would dodge the question. They would say, people at Apple have a really strong sense of mission. And I'd say, yes, but is it fun? And they'd say, uh, there's a tremendous amount of pride of the accomplishment of the company. <laughs> and I'd say, okay, even I, even I get it. I don't want to portray it as a, as a joyless place. I think that would be unfair. I think, for example, I hear stories about you know, engineers who have always dreamt of working on, the, uh, on a Mac since they bought their first Apple IIe as in junior high school are in hogs heaven working, you know, working on Mac software. And I, I have every reason to believe those people are in fact happy. But I am comfortable saying that as a generalization, it's not a joyful work environment. What about their turnover? Yeah, so, well, you know, so, so her question was what about their turnover? Um, yeah, success is a real good tonic for this sort of thing, and uh, so is a stock price that goes from you know eleven or something to to four hundred something, um, and it's all it's also there's also something about being on the winning team. You'll you'll tolerate a lot to be able to say that you're on the on the winning team. So I've been told that that turnover is relatively low, that it's difficult to take engineers out. But this sort of thing is, you know, I don't have data on it. They do, but they won't give that out. And this stuff becomes very anecdotal. You'll cer you certainly hear stories in the Valley about them getting raided. And I think it's happening more and more, as you would expect. But I don't think it's been viewed as a big problem. I am fast. I know they're following all the coverage of my chapter about the, wor about the workplace. And I, you know, I'm very interested to see how that plays out for them. I'll go there and then there, yeah. Can you speak a little bit from a journalist's perspective? What was some of the challenges you faced writing a story about, yeah. a book about um, Apple, how long it took, and how did you overcome some of those challenges with their secrecy and some of the kind of cryptic answers you're probably getting? <laughs> sure. So um, here's the beauty of it. As an investigative journalist, and uh, I come from a place that prides itself on, on good access to corporations, and I've done plenty of those stories o over, my, over the years, uh, I found it incredibly liberating to, to do it the other way and to have, you know, we have a very cordial relationship. I call and I say, here's what I'm doing. Would you like to cooperate? No. <laughs> okay, well, I'll keep you informed. I'll let you know about my timing. I'll let you know what I'm going to say. I'll give you an opportunity to comment. I'll run facts by you. And uh, I, I say liberating in the sense that I then go do my thing with no interference whatsoever, no meddling. And, um, and so my reporting is just a very traditional shoe leather reporting of I call somebody and I ask them to talk and then I say, who else should I talk to? And I go talk to those people. And uh, you asked me about timing. I, I spent most of last year working on this in one form or, or another. And I, I will say, the article really helped the book, so I talked to a lot of people for the article. I quoted a lot of them anonymously. I went back to all those people and interviewed them again for the book, and I called way more people who by this point had read the article, and they said, oh, I know you. You, you, wrote, a, you wrote a fair portrait of the company. And one last thing is um, I found... So Apple's position, by the way, is that there's only one subject they want to comment on, and that's their products. And they'll comment on that on their time frame, not yours. But they, they want the coverage by journalists to be about their products. Any other subject is not of professional interest to them. Uh, I respect that. I totally get it. Um, but um, when I, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought on their schedule, you were keeping them abreast. Thank you. Apple people disagree. The Apple people would like this story to be told. They're very proud of, of, of the company's accomplishments. They may, it may be a tough place to work, but they think they've done great stuff. And it annoys them, or it pains them maybe would be a better way of putting it, that no one's written the kind of story that I wrote. They liked it. And I think many I know many people internally did as well. So there was a, my point is there was a willingness among the alumni to cooperate, despite the fear of pissing off Steve Jobs. I'm going to go over here and, and then. So obviously until now the Apple way is working very well for them. Yeah. 
Uh, so to what extent, in your opinion, this recipe can be emulated by other companies, including Microsoft, in a successful way? <laughs> so if we wanted to. If we wanted to. <laughs> How can other companies uh, emulate Apple, including Microsoft? I'm not going to touch the Microsoft thing with a 10-foot pole here. Um, you should go to your cafe and, and coffee shops and, and discuss that and tell me what you come up with. But uh, I, I've described this as a something of a don't try this at home type of thing or try it with caution. But I do think, and you, you, know, you, you, you have to go through the book sort of chapter and verse and say, right, could we do this, could we do that, no, yes, no. I think every company could be better at, at uh, focusing its message. I think every company could be better asking the honest question, is this something we really want to be doing? Should we have said no to this instead? I think every company should say, is this a product we're proud of that, that we wanted to build because we want to use it? Um, and so on. And so I, I'm not advocating that any company um, uh, be, be so closed off to journalists as they are. And by the way, I'll tell you straight up, I've said it many times, I've always admired the way Microsoft is willing to engage its critics uh, in, in the press in a very fair way. Microsoft's attitude is, you know, if you want to come in and take the time to tell us what you're, what you're going to write, we want to take, generally, we want to take the time to comment on it. Love that. I respect it and admire it. But that's just, that's not the Apple way. Yes. Yeah, did employees talk to you about the manufacturing uh, problems going on in China at all? No, I, I didn't focus on the manufacturing problems, that, uh, the issues that, that Foxconn, that the New York Times has written about recently. And uh, I don't have any good reason for why I didn't. I, I may have felt that it wasn't central to the story that I was, that I was telling. Um, and so this is, in fact, Tim Cook's first big PR test. And he hasn't deviated from the script yet. And uh, in that they didn't cooperate, they didn't comment, he really hasn't said anything other than that one em employee memo that was leaked that was defensive and emotional but didn't say anything. And um, so, I, but I will say that I believe that they're really flummoxed by this. I believe they do care, that they, they feel they have tried to do the right thing in China. I think they feel picked on. In fact, I would state it more neutrally. I mean, they are being picked on. The New York Times, I think, was fair in saying we could have written this about any consumer electronics company. I haven't seen if anyone's queried Microsoft yet, but Microsoft will need to have its answer ready on this because I assume that, that you know, phones with the, with the Windows license in it are made in, and other devices are made in, in factories in China. And Apple, is very, Apple has an underdog culture. Apple does not used to being the top dog. So this is an uncomfortable position for them. Yes. I don't hear a lot of Apple bashing at Microsoft. Uh, I'm just curious at Apple if there's Microsoft bashing. <laughs> I think I think people would follow Jobs would have followed Jobs' lead on that, and I think Jobs slowed down his or diminished his his Microsoft bashing over time, and he switched targets with Google being his favorite target toward toward the end of his life. But I don't. You know, I've, I know people who've worked at both companies, and that's a subject that they like to talk about, but I wouldn't characterize it as bashing, and it hasn't come up in that, in that way. Yeah, right in front. Um, before Jobs stepped down, uh, there was a lot of accounts that he was rearranging the company to put Jonathan Ives pretty much in complete operational power. Now that Tim Cook's the CEO, do you see that changing? It seems like because design is a big Apple thing, it would make sense that Jonathan Ives would have complete operational power pretty much. No, I, I don't agree. I never, I never saw that in any credible source. I, and, I, and the Apple people I talked to say that that would be a preposterous thing to do. He's not an operational person. And um, he's very powerful, but he doesn't need operational control of the company to have that power. But in, in terms of, you know, with me, how Jobs tended to make a lot of the choices in the product and had final say. From what I understand, Jonathan Ives is kind of assuming that role. Is that true? I, or? I think it's speculation. I think it may well be true, but uh, that they would deputize him, as it were, to make key design or key product decisions. But I don't have anything on that. And I haven't, you know, I try to read everything credible, and I certainly haven't seen anything credible about that. So 
we're coming up to a hard stop at, at four. So, um, one last? One last. Okay, I should, oh, I feel like I, yeah, thanks. So you said that Apple <coughs> effectively works by predicting what people will like, right? Between, let's say, the Apple II and the iMac, they weren't terrifically good at doing that. They had a lot of products that would come out and people go, okay, that's neat, but they wouldn't buy the products. Right. Starting with the iMac, everything started to work. Right. What changed? Well, I mean, to give you a pat answer, Steve Jobs changed. But what really changed? And, well, I, my sense is that he learned a lot and made an awful lot of mistakes at Next. And he was a, he was a better CEO when he came back. He had ideas about structure that he didn't have before. So he, re he restructured how the company worked and got it pulling in one direction the way I described. Uh, I described to you that, they, that, they, that, they, that, that he gutted the product lineup and got the company to focus. I mean, maybe a short substantive answer to your question is during that period they weren't focused. So it's not one thing, but that would be one very important thing. He got the company focused on doing just a few things. So if they had done the right subset of all of those products that weren't very successful, you think they would have succeeded? I think that doing all of the products prevented them from getting to the right subset. Um, and, but make no mistake, what, what you, what you're, you're raising an interesting issue, which is that it is a hit-driven company and it is a bet-the-company company. company. Now, that's ameliorated a little bit by the success of the Macintosh over these past 10 years. It's a cash cow now, which can cover up some sins. But if the iPad had, cra had, had been terrible, that would have been really bad, I think. But they probably would have been smart enough just not to bring it out. We'll find out. Over the, you know, they've, they've been very graceful at having these littler things like the Apple TV of calling it a hobby so that we don't focus on it. And in fact, they don't go into mass production on it, so fair, totally fair. It's, it is a small thing. But if they go big on something and it's a flop, then, then, we'll, then we'll know that the strategy... I, I don't think this strategy is perfect. It is, in fact, a risky strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.